opinion scientist in the background. I uh, need to click on it again, I'm afraid Gareth, keep going. But anyway, before we just go through this lot now, and with all due respect, some of you will have seen this, maybe in the past. Um, but it still stands uh, uh, to this very day, ladies and gents. Uh, when I was asked to become a coach, um, you know, and do the job, um, whilst I was in the Royal Navy, um, I thought, okay, you know, here we are, I've been asked to do this job as a national racing coach. How and what do you do? How do you turn people from where they are as novices, if you like, or beginners at racing, into world champions, Olympic champions? And I thought about it long and hard, as you would expect any coach to do, and came up with uh, what I believe are, are the ten aspects of the most challenging sport in the world. And I thought I'd just take this opportunity to briefly go through them with you all, and then if anybody's got any questions or whatever, please sing out later on. Uh, but for me, we'll go to the first one first, please, Gareth. Um, first one for me, self-preparation, uh, both physical and mental. Um, now, as a coach, with all due respect, I don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, mind, obviously I don't mind, where you are working, at what level you work as a coach, whether it's a club level, regional level, national level, international level. Our philosophy about the game, the big picture, is the same for every single one of us. It's just that at each one of these aspects of the game, you know, to be a club champion, you don't need to be quite as good as the guy who's going to go out there and win the you know, Olympic gold medal. But the theory and the background and the training is most certainly all the same. Yeah? I mean, I'll never forget when I won my first gold medal, which was at a European Championship in the Bay of Cadiz, while I was crewing for Lord Nelson on HMS Victory. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of what he taught me back in 1805 still applies to this very day. In other words, what I'm saying is, ladies and gents, there's a lot of things in our sport that will never change, you get the idea, and still apply to this very day, and will do <laughs> forever, they can't change, yeah, uh, and some of those obviously will be listed here, uh, but physically, uh, yeah, and mentally, uh, I personally as a coach <coughs> put that as number one aspect of our sport, in other words, how many times have I seen as a coach, in my time as a coach, and especially in the youth programme, young people uh, sailing boats where I know as a coach, physically, they don't stand a cat in else chance of doing well because their best feature is in the wrong ship for them. Do you get the idea? In body weight terms, strength terms, okay? And uh, how many times I see youngsters being moved on uh, for example, from an optimist to a laser radio, when they're nowhere near ready for it. Or, they're being kept in an optimist for far too long. You know, they should have gone sooner, so they could progress through the sport a lot quicker and more efficiently. Do you get the idea? So, to me, this physical side of the game is very important. Fitness training, fitness testing, okay? And most certainly, uh, making sure that the people you're working with can be competitive in that particular class across the wind range, whether it's two to four knots of breeze in flat water, yeah, or blowing 30 knots of breeze in big waves, wind over tide. They've got to handle it across the wind range and the sea state, okay? And that is what we're looking for when we're coaching. Are they capable of doing what you're asking them to do, yeah? Because if they're not, you as a coach are wasting your time, point number one. And uh, point number two, the ferret is wasting their time. Okay, they're never going to get there. Uh, so, you know, let's be realistic about the big picture, yeah? Uh, in physical terms and fitness terms. Mentally, uh, yeah, um, I, um, rightly or wrongly, certainly, I would uh, stand here and say... Uh, that uh, in the first, um, yeah, maybe 40 to 50 percent of my time as a coach, I didn't really uh, look much towards sports science or, you know, uh, um, the psychological side of sports medicine, whatever, whatever, whatever. 
because I thought as a coach I could get around all that, uh, you know, just by using nine lace holes of the rectum or whatever, whatever, you know, some verbal words at the right time, okay? But with all due respect, as the sport evolved and obviously sports medicine evolved and we went on and on and on and on, uh, I got more into it because I could see there was a, a place for it, yeah? And there is. But, mark my words, there's a place for it, but don't go too far down that pathway if you don't need to. It's just an extra burden on the sailor, if you get the idea. If you think they can do it without the sports science bit, let them get on with it, okay? There are people out there who are seat of the pants sailors, yeah? And don't need the sports science bit or whatever. They're just naturals, let them get on, okay? They'll win. They don't need anything else. Why clutter their brains with things they don't need to know about? So we can overload the sailors, yeah, with information and knowledge when they don't need it. I'm a great believer in keeping it simple, sailor. That magic word, kiss, yeah, it's always in the back of my mind. K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, sailor. And the simpler it is, the more chance you stand of actually winning, okay? The more complicated it gets, you're now bogging people down, and uh, concentration levels start to disappear, okay? Uh, so, only a thought there. Uh, I think there's uh, certainly, you know, an element uh, of mental preparation, yes. Uh, I guess the key things for me are, on the mental side, uh, that we've got to make sure that uh, uh, the sailors, have, don't matter who they are, Optimist Sailors, America's Cup Sailors, yeah, everybody in between, that they've got the confidence to do well. And I think that's a key point. They've got the confidence that they can do well. And I think that's very important. And the only way any competitor will have the confidence that they can do well is when they've completed a training program. Okay? Now they can be confident that they can go to an event and actually stand a chance of doing well. They will never be confident unless they've completed a training program covering all ten aspects of the most challenging sport in the world, yeah? Uh, and that's what I definitely feel uh, uh, confident about in my mind uh, as a racing coach, okay? Um, the other thing is, uh, whilst we're on the mental side, ladies and gents, is this, expectations. Uh, one ferret, uh, uh, no names, but one ferret sticks out in my mind, interviewed after the event at the Olympic Games, um, in uh, Athens and uh, he went on TV in his interview and uh, said, quote, we came here expecting to win the gold medal and I just looked at the TV screen and went, how many times have I told you never ever to expect anything because if you expect to win, mark my words, that is when you are overconfident, point number one, and point number two, when the mistakes will start creeping in. And they did. Do you get the idea? And that mentally, there's a subtle difference here. Confident that we can do well, as long as everything goes our way at the championship, yeah? Uh, and, okay, obviously, never having that expect expectation that you are going to win. Because you win, you know, chances are, nine times out of ten, you won't. Um, classic uh, scenario for you here, really, Stuart Chilverley, born and bred here, so to speak. You know, the three gold medals that we won together as coach and competitor, every time I'd say to Stuart, what's the game plan, Stuart, what are we doing? And uh, his immediate reaction, and I think it's fair to say that this is with the majority of top sailors I've worked with over the years, uh, I'd like to be in the top ten. Yeah, I'll be happy if I go to this World Championship and finish in the top ten. That is their mental approach, to get the idea. Now, okay, so we work on being in the top ten. And then as the event unrolls and you get race number one, race number two, race number three, and the whole thing starts rolling along, ah, so-and-so has been disqualified in a protest last night. Oh, that's handy, good. You know, uh, uh, oh, so-and-so got OCS'd in that uh, second race today. Oh, is that right? Good. 
Now, let the race management team or the jury do the work for you. Do you get the idea? Don't get involved with the race committee. Don't get involved with the protest committee. We don't do that. Okay. Um, and uh, just recently, Andy Beesworth, uh, I was with him at the Dragon World Championships in Weymouth two weeks ago. Exactly the same answer. Andrew and Stuart are both at the same batch of ferrets. Both youth world champions, both won three gold medals uh, in the actual class and now the dragon class. And Andy's approach was just the same. Jim, we're going down there, top ten, I'll be happy. And we never won the gold medal till the last beat of the last race in a photo finish on the finishing line by one point. And that's how tight it was. Maybe one of the most exciting finishes I've ever seen at a world championship. A photo finish in the last beat of the last race. Having matched race the, the Russian guys all the way down to Portland Bill and back. You know, uh, you know, it's just amazing how things unfold. So we won the gold medal. Awesome. Uh, but there's so many things we've got to, as coaches, be thinking about, yeah, uh, with regards to the ultimate aim, a gold medal. Whether it's at club level, regional level, national level, or international level. Next one, please, Gareth. And um, so that's point number one. Next one, boat preparation. Um, yeah, very briefly on this one, obviously making sure that our ships are ready for racing. Uh, hull, foils, sails, the technology, class rules, obviously, yeah. Uh, measurement certificates, insurance, I can go on forever about the boots. But f for me, this is the second most important aspect of our sport. You're ready for it, physically and mentally, what about your ship? Worst case scenario, I can give it to you. Olympic Games, 1996, Danish sailing team. One of the, one of the favourites to win a gold medal in 1996. Turned up at the Olympic Games, his sailing went into the measurement tent, never came out. How about that? He spent four years, thousands upon thousands of Danish kroner to be there over a four-year period, and the boat never came out of the measurement tent. Did he, win, did he win a medal? No. Yeah. Because he had to then charter a boat that was legal and therefore didn't stand a cat in hell's chance of winning a medal. You know, why put yourselves at that sort of risk? And as coaches, we've got to make sure that our sailors don't fall into that trap of fronting up at events with illegal ships, okay? Uh, or obviously uh, ending up in a, a measurement protest at any stage of a championship. So to me, this is why I put it so high on my shopping list as a coach, uh, the business of boat preparation. Yeah? Of course we want the best, and we want to make sure that our boat is as good as, if not better than anybody else's, within the class rules. Uh, and at the end of the day, that takes a certain amount of time. Um, you know, and if you've got a more complicated ship, the more hours are required for you to make sure it's ready for a championship, yeah? Whether it's a club level, or Olympic level, or whatever, okay? And then it stays in one piece when it is blowing 30 knots of breeze, yeah? And you've got two races in one day, you know? You've got to be realistic about the situation. When we're in Sydney, uh, with the star class racing in the outer, uh, outer harbour, or even outside sometimes, we even had plans as to how to replace the mast if they broke it between races. You know, you've got to think about these things, you know? You're one mile offshore, how do you get a new mast in a starboat? You know, having snapped it in the first race. You know, all these what-if scenarios are going on between competitors and coaches, yeah? Uh, and again, you know, we need to think about it uh, so we don't uh, uh, make mistakes in this particular section. Next one to address with you as uh, uh, coaches, boat handling. Yeah. Now, boat handling wise, uh, ladies and gents, again, with all due respect, you know, I know. If you can't handle the boat properly, two knots of breeze, flat water, 30 knots of breeze, wind over tide, okay, we're not in the ballpark. And that's why we, GBR, we, spend many hours on the water training, boat handling skills, tacking, jibing, hoisting spinnakers, dropping spinnakers, mark rounding, okay, uh, everything you would be expected to do on a racetrack. We are out there practicing. 
and that takes so many hours, okay? Uh, obviously, out of um, uh, the rest of your lives, whether you are being educated or at work or whatever, 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 and needs planning. Um, so that side, generally speaking, it's fair for me to stand here and say that whenever I go to events with British sailors, the standard of boat handling is really good. You know, I mean, it really is. I mean, you can just see, it sticks out like a sore thumb. You know, just how good the Brits are when it comes to turning corners, yeah. Uh, but we put the time in. You know, we do the mileage in that area. Uh, and don't get me wrong, it's all done at club level, yeah. That's where it's done. I wish I had a pound coin for every hour I've spent on either Rutland Water, Grafham Water, or wherever in the UK through the winter months, you know. Uh, putting the main sheets, as we all know, into the shower to thaw them out and, you know, get the blocks working. How many times have we done that? Uh, and it all adds up, you know, the time on the water. Yes? Okay. Next one, please, uh, Gareth. Uh, <coughs> boat tuning. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, uh, a Im very important topic. It's fourth on my shopping list here in coaching terms. Going fast in a straight line. Whether we are going to windward, reaching or running, yeah? We need to be going fast in a straight line, obviously. Now, in the majority, uh, okay, of one design classes, the majority, nobody's going to turn up at a, you know, national, European, world event <coughs> going two or three knots faster than anybody else, okay? We know that as coaches. We know that the top 10, maybe top 20 boats are going to be going around this track as near as damn it, all the same speed. Yeah, uh, and as long as you know your ferrets, the people you're working with, are you know going fast in a straight line on any point of sailing, then we stand a chance of obviously being in the ballpark. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, on the more tactical racing machines, like let me just uh, off the top of my head, laser one. You know, there's a tactical racing machine. You know, it's all about positioning rather than boat speed. Okay, and it's all about boat handling. Yeah. Whereas if you're in a Flying Dutchman, or a Tornado, or an America's Cup catamaran, yeah, it's all about going fast in a straight line for quite a long time. Because they don't tank much, and they don't giant much, to get the idea. You know, so there, the boat speed is more critical. Whereas in a tactical boat, it isn't. You know, uh, you've got to be realistic about how important is boat speed. Uh, and if you are in a tactical racing class, then the boat speed, as long as you're going as quick as everybody else, yeah, then, you know, you ain't going to go any quicker, so don't waste your time trying to. Uh, but in other classes, obviously you can go two, three knots quicker or whatever, as was shown in the recent America's Cup, yeah? Where did those Americans find that extra two to three knots, you know, uh, to make that recovery? They found it from somewhere. It wasn't just Ben Ainsley, mark my words. They changed something on that boat, uh, you know, and it was the two things together that went from, obviously, 8.1 to 9.8, yeah? Uh, so think about that. Now, the other issue here, of course, ladies and gents, is wind, sea state, and boat tuning controls. <coughs> um, we need to be going fast, as I say, flat water, big waves, and have a thorough knowledge and use of the boat tuning controls. <coughs> With all due respect, I guess over the years, you know, I, I'm, as coaches, you could ask the sailors that you're working with, you know, what does the Cunningham Hull do? And, uh, you know, they'll uh, hopefully give you some sort of answer. But then, you know, you as the coach are going to maybe just tidy that up a bit and make, uh, you know, define it a bit more as to exactly what it does, when to use it, how to use it, how much, you know. Fang tension, kicking strap tension, clue out all controls. You can go on. There's loads of them. Uh, again, I'm a great believer in keeping it simple. The less you've got to play with, the the better, yeah, uh, because at the end of the day, how many times have I seen as a racing coach, and you're the same, I'm sure, where a ferret is going very, very fast in a straight line, but in the wrong bleeding direction. <laughs> uh, and how many times do we see this? Yeah, uh, so it's got its place. Boat tuning has obviously got its place, and in my uh, philosophy of coaching and the way I train people, um, it's number four on the shopping list. Okay, next one please. Uh, after that, um, race strategy. Uh, yeah, knowing which way to go. Now this, with all due respect, is one of, if not the topic, that never changes. 
when Horatio briefed us the night before that championship race in the Bay of Cadiz, we knew exactly which way we were going and reasons for, okay? And that has not changed to this very day. That stays the same, okay? Uh, whether you are in the Northern Hemisphere racing or the Southern Hemisphere racing, where obviously it all becomes a mirror image, yeah? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, the geographical surroundings, tide, surface current uh, throughout the race time. Um, what I found interesting uh, about doing the Dragon Worlds a couple of weeks ago uh, was our training partner was Laurie Smith. Uh, Andy Bees with Laurie Smith together. Uh, Laurie Smith's uh, uh, supporter, Stuart Coach, Romney Patterson, who I'm sure most of you here uh, know, uh, triple Olympic medalist. And uh, he had this book with him with you know, all the information about the tide in Weymouth Bay. You know, in other words, it had been researched. We knew exactly what the tide was doing, when it was going to do it, where it was weaker, where it was stronger, and of course all that information was being pumped into the two boats to good effect, because with all due respect, a lot of that information that those two teams were given was you know, pretty damn spot on. Uh, and what g gave us the positions that we got at the end of the event, yeah? It was all about race strategy. Uh, as well as, don't get me wrong, dragons, straight line boat speed, yeah, upwind and downwind. Okay, next one. Uh, starting. Yeah, well, here we go. Uh, getting out of the ferric trip. You know, as a coach, as a competitor, same as I do. It's all about being in the right place at the right time. Uh, it's all about having a starting plan. It's all about identifying which third of the starting line you're going to go from and relating that, obviously, to your race strategy. Yeah? So you've got a game plan as to which way you want to go up the first beat and that alone dictates where, which third of the starting line you will start from. If you don't, you will not be amongst the chocolates at the win-win mark. Simple. Keep it simple, sailor. Yes? Okay. So, again... Briefings in the morning, we know the race area, we know the wind direction, we know what the tide's doing, if applicable. Uh, we've decided, before the ferry even leaves the dock, which third of the starting line they will go from, so that they are in the top ten at the woman mark. Do you get the idea? And at the end of the day, ladies and gents, it's then down to them to be, you know, where we've discussed being, okay? And that's the game uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so, where to be in a starting line, why you want to be there, and obviously your starting technique, starting ability. Again, how many times do we see people, you know, coming out of the ferric trap with uh, a start, which you and I would look at as a coach, and we know straight away from that start that that ferret or set of ferrets are down the tube and round the S-bend. Yeah? <laughs> because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay. Uh, or, they did not put the bow down soon enough for the speed build, to get the idea, so the boat on their weather side didn't just sail over the top of them. Or, they didn't create the space to leeward, okay, so they could put the bow down and accelerate off the line front row clear wind. So all these things, as coaches, we need to focus on when it comes to starting techniques and starting ability. Yeah, and we do, uh, in training. Okay. Next one, please, Gareth. <coughs> I'm just going to skirt through a lot of these things, uh, ladies and gents, because in the time frame we've got this evening, obviously there's a lot to be thinking about as a coach. Tactics. Uh, I break it down into three areas, boat to boat, boat to group, and boat to fleet. Uh, three areas in their own right, yeah, uh, as to where they want to be um, uh, in relationship to another boat or a group of boats or our management of the rest of the fleet, okay? Um, as regards tactics, though, uh, again, as a coach, I try to keep it simple when I'm in the training mode. And the message, three key bullet points, really. Number one bullet point, start. Number two bullet, bullet point, having started, yeah, because you've made a good one, consolidate. Third bullet point, stay between the opposition, or the majority of the opposition, and the next mark. Okay, uh, and then you can go on from that when you're in a venue like this, shifty conditions, you know, always take the tank that takes you closest to the mark, yeah? Otherwise we end up sailing the great semicircles, yes, in wind shifts. Uh, 
uh, at the Dragon Wells in Weymouth. We had a northwesterly wind for two days. Where did the leaders come from in a northwester? As, as expected, working the shifts more up the middle. Anybody who touched the corners, down the tube, round the S bend. You get the idea. So things like that you need to be addressing when we start talking about the subject of tactics. And it's a big area, it's a big subject. Okay, Gareth? Right. <laughs> racing rules. How many racing rules are there? <coughs> 91. So why have I got 92 then? There's only 91, but the 92nd racing rule is always buy your coach a drink. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we tell the ferrets, okay, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but seriously, from a coaching point of view, this, okay, uh, uh, area uh, of our sport is um, and has been, even, I mean, in the good old days with Horatio, when he had one racing rule, look them and leave them. You know, that was it. End of. Uh, but now, you know, since 1805, we've now got 92 racing rules, okay? Do the ferrets need to know all 92? Answer? No, they don't. Uh, that's the good news. But what they've got to know, for sure, are the fundamental rules of our sport, okay? How many of them are there? Answer? Us as coaches, the people you work with, have got to know all five, okay? If they don't, we're not getting out the blocks here, uh, realistically, from a learning point of view, from a teaching point of view. After that, okay, we've got the definitions. If we don't know the definitions, ladies and gents, we cannot use the rule book. How many definitions are there? Twenty, okay? You as instructors, coaches, okay, uh, uh, you're teaching the game. You need to know what the 20 definitions are, so you can teach it, yeah? Uh, when you're working at club level, regional level, national level, international level. We're on the way out to the start of a dragon race. Andy Beesworth called me over. You know, I'm driving this super duper rig, and, uh, as you would. And, uh, you know, he pulled me over and says, hey Jim, uh, penalties, because this was the match race day, the last day, with the Russians. He says to me, he says, um, when can I take the penalty? After the start, or after the prep signal. So there you go, you know, a full-on international professional sailor had forgotten, couldn't remember that simple question about the racing rules. Do you get the idea? So he just asked me, openly, you know, remind me, I've forgotten. So I had to tell him, as soon as you've had the prep signal, yeah, you can then thereafter, if you pick up a penalty, take the penalty before the starting signal, yeah? So if you're going to make a mistake, do it at 3 minutes 59 seconds. <laughs> yeah, not 10 seconds before the start. You get the idea. So you can blow it away and it doesn't affect your start. Okay. So things like that we need to be on the ball about. Once you've got the definitions away, ladies and gents, uh, rule 10 to 24. Now that is the nitty gritty. You as coaches need to know all of them. You need to be able to rattle them off uh, when you're giving the ferrets a lecture or a session on the racing rules. Uh, and then the other one of importance for me, uh, most definitely Rule 60, uh, how to handle a protest. You'll be amazed how many people, you know, when I go to events, how many people have maybe never even been in a protest room, you know, at club level, let alone in front of an international jury at a major event. Do you get the idea? You know, and I think that's an area of major concern in this country is our lack of knowledge of the racing rules and people not bothering with them at club level. And if they don't bother with them at club level, how do you expect them to know them when they get to national level or international level? And the answer is they don't. And that's scary for me as a coach, you know. When you look at the other nine aspects of the sport and how much money people are spending at the game, yeah, to then go to a major event and be disqualified because you didn't know the rule. That is inexcusable, really. You know, so we've got to be on the case when teaching the subject of the racing rules. Next one, please, Gareth. Um, compass work. Yeah, I fully appreciate on a lake or a reservoir you don't need one. Because you can see when you're being lifted, headed, whatever, you know. 
But Map My Works, this is the place where we start teaching the young people how to use them. Okay? Because when they get on the big wide open ocean and there's nothing to point at, they're lost completely and utterly when it comes to wind shifts and wind bends, yeah? I wonder why they're not amongst the chocolates that are on the mark. Because they've missed a shift. Uh, or they've missed a wind bend, you know, an actual wind bend in the race area, whatever, whatever. So, for me, uh, this is an important aspect of our game. Orientation of the race area, start line, line bias, all the rest of it, yeah. They need to learn at club level onwards uh, when it comes to compass work. Uh, one event's highlighted that for me for sure. Youth Worlds in Korea, uh, 1995. Uh, starting line, laser one class, 40 votes on the line. Uh, the race committee started the race, as soon as it started, bang, sea fret, down. You couldn't see that white shutter at the end of the room. And I thought to myself, oh my God, next time I see this lot, they'll be in Japan. Um, and, you know, uh, I had a bearing, obviously, uh, of exactly where the that was, distance, time and distance, boat speed, your magic triangle, distance, speed, time, yeah? times 60 over 1, in your head, between your port and starboard of your lobe, working out <laughs> how long it takes you to spend on one tack and then the other, yeah? And I went up to the woman, Mark, sat there, I could only see as far as the length of this room. Out of the mist, first laser appeared, followed by the second, followed by the third, they came around the woman, Mark, I thought, awesome, these ferrets have done their homework, they've been taught well by their coaches. Went off to the outer loop, Mark, yeah? No time, by the way, to their advantage, where we were, sat there, out the mist they came. Down the leeway mark, out the mist they came. They went round the whole race track in very poor visibility. The race committee never abandoned the race, the race stood. How about that? You know, so think about it. Compass work is very important to racing people because they're not going to spend all their lives racing on lakes and reservoirs. Okay?